Who would have thought anything this week was going to top the spicy drama between Pokimane and Ninja? And yes, that's sarcasm because who gives a sh**. But ladies and gentlemen, it does turn out that admonishing your audience, not great for business. And I mean, if you truly cared about this issue, kind of confusing the silence on, you know, the events of the past few months with companies like Activision Blizzard. But sure, enjoy the viral moment, which somewhat fails to recognize the prime days of G4 TV and why many people, for better or worse, I suppose, liked it. In games media news, Sifu's Kung Fu Brawling is made by a studio full of white developers. Yeah, that's that's a headline. A real one. And there are other articles just like it. These journalists are gonna have it rough when they discover how many Japanese developers feature almost exclusively Western characters in their games, as noted by Oliver Jia of NK News. It's so bizarre seeing how writers in the West have such disdain for developers trying to make games about other cultures. We saw it before with Ghost of Tsushima, in which it was celebrated by Japanese media. The studio was even honored by becoming ambassadors of the Tsushima Island. Well, there was a bit of a different reaction here in the States, in which a decent amount of writers wrote pieces critical about Sucker Punch making a game based on Japanese culture. So yeah, I don't understand the point of these articles and just find these super woke Western journalists work more harmful than anything to creativity. If you're at all wondering what happens to live service games that don't make all the money in the world, look no further than Star Wars Battlefront 2. That game support came to an end a few years ago, and it definitely seems like EA was literal about completely moving on from it as the game's multiplayer has been broken for months on PC. EA is now saying that they are working on a fix, in which, since October, players have reported a widespread issue that made entire lobbies of characters unkillable. Now, although EA says that they are committed to fixing this, there has been no communication on when, so kind of sucks if you still enjoy playing Star Wars Battlefront 2. Now, Battlefield 2042 received its first update from DICE in 2022, and soon the game will be getting a new scoreboard, which is better, but still doesn't compare to the ones in the past entries. It seems all AAA companies that run shooters seem to not want to allow players to see their opponent's deaths, and I promise you, the reasoning is always the same, potential toxicity. Which is funny in the case of Battlefield 2042, because you know, there's no voice chat functionality yet. Anyway, this game has much bigger issues, many of which I doubt will be addressed anytime soon. BioWare is entering 2022 in a very questionable position. The company has been depleted of talent the last few years, and still expectations are through the roof for Dragon Age 4, even following the disasters that were Anthem and Mass Effect Andromeda. BioWare General Manager Gary McKay published a blog post to end to the new year saying, We are laser focused on building back the trust of our fans and community, and we plan to do that by delivering the types of games that we are best known for and ensuring they are the highest quality. We feel that we have the right people, the right creative focus, and the support from EA to deliver on the promise. Actions speak louder than words, and truly only time will tell if those remarks are meaningful, but looking from the outside in, extremely concerning that Dragon Age 4 lost its creative director just two months ago. That's on top of all the other departures of key Dragon Age 4 staff that have happened in the last year or two. This pattern was what we saw with Anthem and Mass Effect Andromeda pre-release. Let's hope it doesn't reach the same conclusion. Before Microsoft announced historic news of them purchasing Activision Blizzard for about $70 billion, in a new report from the Wall Street Journal, it turns out notorious games industry villain Activision Blizzard is still doing villain stuff. It's been claimed that more than three dozen Activision Blizzard employees have been let go, while around another 40 have been disciplined over misconduct. The reason why this is notable is because Kodak didn't want the public finding out about this. It suggests that their culture of misconduct runs deep, and quote unquote, could make the company's workplace problems seem bigger than is already known. Activision, of course, denies this. It was also further claimed that Kodak was thinking about buying Kotaku or PC Gamer to change the narrative, aka buy positive press coverage. Then, in an interview with GameSpeed, and I just want to point out, it'd be nice if some of these games industry publications that interview these high-profile figures, you know, you push back on some of these responses. Just a note that I had. Kodak, he implied that what hurt their stock price in the last year was more so not releasing the Diablo and Overwatch sequels and the poor performance of Call of Duty Vanguard, which is just funny and not true. The stock was certainly impacted by that, but the big dips came when the company was exposed for its culture of misconduct. In this Games Beat interview, Kodak multiple times just straight up lies, and again, doesn't get any pushback. And he says they also cared about inclusivity, diversity, and creating a safe work environment despite, you know, months of reporting to the contrary, in which the company was allegedly destroying evidence and Kodak was posing 
as a female executive to lash out at the widespread misconduct allegations that he allowed and enabled for years. As scummy as all of that sounds, in a year or so, none of this will matter because Big Daddy Microsoft is going to enact big culture changes. Also, as expected, it's been reported that once this deal is finalized, Kodak is gone. He'll ride off into the sunset with his hundreds of millions that he'll make from this deal. It seems like it's going to be about 400 million. So definitely a big payday for him. Since my last video, which was me just in utter shock, we have gotten some further details. Microsoft wasn't actually Activision Blizzard's first option. It's been reported by Bloomberg that Microsoft's Phil Spencer approached Activision with a merger proposal, and then Activision decided to find other interested parties, likely wanting a bidding war. It's claimed that Activision tried to garner interest from Facebook and one other big company, the rumor is that that other big company was Electronic Arts, for purchasing them. But it appears there wasn't any serious interest from anybody other than Microsoft. So with Activision hesitating, Microsoft then backed off and said that they were happy to remain partners, but obviously soon after, Activision came back to the table and gave Microsoft this bargain deal of $70 billion. Now with this deal, there have been many wondering if this gets into antitrust monopoly territory, and thus far legal experts have indicated that this will not be an issue. David Hopp, a managing partner at the San Francisco-based media and tech law firm Gamma Law, told IGN that the deal should go through. It would be quite ridiculous at this point to try to make an antitrust case on the basis that the acquisition will result in less consumer choice in the shooter games product category, for example. However, Gene Munster, founder of tech investment firm Loop, appeared on CNBC and sounded a bit more skeptical about what could happen. He stated the title of this episode should be Silicon Valley slash DC Collision Course because effectively what Microsoft and Activision are doing is saying we don't buy it DC, we don't buy that you want to create greater control around these companies, we don't believe that you ultimately want to break up these companies. Munster would continue stating that based on what many US lawmakers have said in recent years this would and should be a moment for them to show that they want control over corporate America by blocking this deal but he concludes saying he doubts that happens and ultimately believes in the end, the deal gets done. The reaction to this major acquisition has left many people wondering what the competition will do, and when I say competition, I mean Sony, because Nintendo always does their own thing, and they do it successfully very well. Some have said Sony should target Electronic Arts or even Take-Two Interactive. The issue is that Sony doesn't have that type of money. It's far more likely we see Sony go after the likes of Konami, Square Enix, Capcom, or maybe even Ubisoft. What's becoming clear, though, is that consolidation is happening. We're going to see more more and more acquisitions. It just remains to be seen if Sony breaks the bank open. There's also the concern if maybe Google, Amazon, Apple, Tencent, or even Disney jumps into the fold and maybe targets one of these companies, like say, Sony. As it stands, it appears Sony has about $24 billion set to the side for mergers and acquisitions, as well as about $17 billion as cash on hand. Jeff Keighley shared this graphic of the market caps of the remaining top publishers in this games industry, and maybe sometime in the near future, Sony will make a big move. Just understand that these companies have to want to sell, and they also aren't selling even close to those numbers. It'll be much more. There's also the real possibility that Microsoft is not done. This is the difference between a billion dollar company and a trillion dollar one. Microsoft had $130 billion cash on hand prior to this Activision Blizzard deal, so while some believe Sony needs to stay where they are and just continue to deliver killer first party games, I think we're getting to a point where their hand is being forced as the competition is upping their value, and over time, whether Sony does it or not, other companies will jump into the mix and start gobbling up the remaining top publishers. In the next couple of years, it's very likely only a few major gaming publishers will remain. It'll be very similar to what we've seen happen to Hollywood. Since the announcement of this historic deal, Sony's stock has tanked about 13%, losing over $20 billion in market cap, with many in Wall Street having questions about their future. Sony will have a monumental challenge on its hand to stand its own in the war of attrition, wrote Amir N. Vazarde, a market strategist at Asymmetric Advisors. Meanwhile, shares for Square Enix, Capcom, Konami, EA, Take-Two, and Ubisoft were all up following the Activision Blizzard Microsoft news, and that's because Wall Street can smell the inevitable acquisitions. The question is though, who buys who and for how much? As of recording this video, Sony has given their first public response to this Xbox Activision Blizzard deal saying, we expect that Microsoft will abide by contractual agreements and continue to ensure Activision games are multi-platform. Now while that isn't much, it does indicate for the next few years, games like Call of Duty and the PlayStation exclusivity with it will continue, but after that, who really knows? In the past, we've seen Xbox honor Bethesda's deal with Sony for PlayStation timed exclusivity with Deathloop and Ghost 
Ghostwire Tokyo, so of course they will honor this and already know about Activision's deals with Sony. But this purchase wasn't about today, it was about tomorrow and the future of where video games are going. And some other Sony news that seems more minor at the moment, it appears the company is gearing up for their very own Game Pass, and Xbox head or now Microsoft Gaming CEO Phil Spencer gave his thoughts, telling IGN, I don't really look at it as validation. I actually, when I'm talking to our teams, I talk about it as an inevitability. So for us, we should continue to innovate, continue to compete, because the things that we're doing might be advantages that we have in the market today, but they're just based on us going first. Not that we've created something that no one else can go create. I like it because it feeds our energy and what the next things that we should be working on as we continue to build out the things that we've done in the past. Because I think the right answer is to ship great games, ship them to PC, ship them to console, ship them on cloud, make them available day one in the subscription. And I expect that's what our competitor will do. Days Gone game director Jeff Ross recently lashed out on Twitter at Sony over how Days Gone was viewed internally versus Ghost of Tsushima. Ross, who is no longer at Ben's studio, responded to a tweet which highlighted and celebrated that Ghost of Tsushima had sold more than 8 million copies. At the time I left Sony, Days Gone had been out for a year and a half and a month and sold over 8 million copies. It's since gone on to sell more and then a million plus on Steam. Local studio management always made us feel like it was a big disappointment. Responding to a few tweets, Ross claimed that Sony didn't even read their pitch for a Days Gone sequel and that Sony management had more faith in Death Stranding than Days Gone. Ultimately, I think the reason why a sequel is not happening is because of just how messy and long the development of Days Gone was. It's a game I actually liked quite a bit, but the launch was a buggy disaster, and the mediocre reviews hurt this game's future quite a bit. For comparison's sake, Ghost of Tsushima launched without many bugs or issues and was critically acclaimed. Since Ross's tweet, he has since clarified his 8 million sales claim is unconfirmed and was based on sales information from a trophy tracking website that has since shut down. There's also the question of who paid $60 for this versus who got it for free when it was on PS Plus last year. Anyway, I've stated my disappointment appointment in the past that Days Gone was essentially being thrown in the trash by Sony as I think it set up some exciting directions that would have been fun to explore. The game was fun, it definitely had its issues and flaws, but one of my most unpopular gaming opinions is actually that I would have preferred seeing a sequel for this over Horizon Zero Dawn, which I think is a bit overrated, but nevertheless, from what I have seen, I think Forbidden West looks great. And in an alternate timeline, maybe say a former SIE America president and CEO Sean Layden was still around and running things. I imagine we would have seen both a sequel for Horizon and Days Gone. While Jeff Ross didn't take a shot directly at Sony's current leadership, he did however state that as soon as Sean Layden was gone, Days Gone was dead. Recently, we discussed the hashtag Save Red Dead Online campaign, in which many Red Dead fans have protested developer Rockstar Games as they have mostly ceased support for the online component. There has not been a major update in over a year, and even that last update lacked content and was viewed as underwhelming. It was good indication that Rockstar was starting to give up. Anyway, many outlets and influencers reported on this recent Red Dead Online campaign to get Rockstar to care, and thus far the company has basically just ignored their community. Just the other day, they posted a brand new Red Dead Online social media post which promoted 30% off select clothing items, and as you might expect, not many were happy about this. You know, because they didn't get their free beans. I'm just joking. This has been a running theme with Rockstar and their parent company Take-Two Interactive for quite some time. There seems to be a disconnect from reality and a purposeful lack of understanding players' complaints. We saw that recently again when Take-Two CEO Strauss Zelnick appeared on CNBC and essentially lied about the GTA Trilogy remaster disaster. CNBC host Jim Cramer asked Zelnick, okay, because there's been some disagreement about how much it matters, say that one of the two housers left at Grand Theft Auto, Dan, that there have been some defects the new Grand Theft Auto, there's been a, you've always held this, we're not going to put out any game before it's time. Can this smooth out what many of these analysts, although you have not, but smooth out a kind of a longer term view that also adds mobile to make it, that your earnings are less episodic? And Zelnick boldly responded with saying, with regards to the GTA trilogy, that was actually not a new title. That was a remaster of pre-existing titles. We did have a glitch in the beginning, that glitch was resolved. And the title has done just great for the company, so we're very excited. We have an amazing pipeline going forward. The lie detector test determined that was a lie. 
Calling this remaster a giant success is hilarious. It's equally funny that he said a single glitch was resolved and now the product is fixed. The remaster is still very much in rough shape, not just because of the performance issues and bugs, which many do indeed remain, but because of the noticeable downgrades in quality, things that will never be addressed because Take-Two and Rockstar don't care enough. They didn't even develop this project, they threw it off to some mobile port developer with a shoddy reputation, and unfortunately in two years of development they butchered these classic beloved games. It was a lazy, unfinished remaster, which some way somehow was signed off and approved by Rockstar's leadership for release. So yes, this isn't the first or last time Zelnik will openly lie, but it is indeed disappointing seeing a lack of ownership over this travesty of a release. One that spits in the face of fans who expect quality from Rockstar games when their name is attached to something. One of the more iconic voices in gaming, Troy Baker, who has played the role of so many beloved characters over the years, most notably Joel Miller and the Last of Us franchise, well Baker decided to do something very stupid, and that was back NFTs. Baker took to social media saying, I'm partnering with Voiceverse NFT to explore ways where together we might bring new tools to new creators to make new things, and allow everyone a chance to own and invest in the IPs they create. We all have a story to tell, you can hate or you can create, what will it be, and uh, yeah, the people chose hate. Baker would follow up with a non-pology in which he said he just wanted to be a part of the conversation. Regardless of whatever the fuck he means by that, and his hopes and dreams were from this, it backfired big time. See, the NFT company Baker partnered with has been found to be stealing from other creators, and also their mission is essentially the destruction and end to voice actors. Voice NFTs provide unlimited perpetual access to the underlying AI voice that the NFT represents ownership of. If you own a voice NFT, you can create all kinds of voice content, you will own all of the IP. Imagine being able to create customized audiobooks, YouTube videos, e-learning lectures, or even podcasts with your favorite voice. From around the games industry, there was general shock that one of the most prolific actors in gaming would back something like this. Something that can be abused to have, well, say, Baker's voice say some of the most horrific things ever, and Baker would have no control over it. Anyway, appearing in episode 90 of the Play, Watch, Listen podcast, Baker confirmed he was being paid for this partnership, did not expect the level of negativity he would receive, was considering his next course of action, such as maybe ceasing his partnership with this NFT company, said his agent voiced caution about doing something like this, believed indie game makers could benefit by purchasing his voice and using it in their game without paying a premium for his talents, and insinuated that he didn't fully understand what he was backing, which is just irresponsible and dumb in my opinion. Last but not least, we have Cyberpunk 2077. I'm planning and actively working on a much larger video, but I wanted to discuss something controversial that one of the developers said recently. For the last year or so, we've extensively talked about the failures of this game, the many things that did not live up to the hype. I still stand by my opinion of this being a good game, but it has giant flaws, some of which that are honestly astonishing, and largely this all has to do with mismanagement and CDPR's lack of investment into the technical side of this game. More than 365 days after launch, we still don't have a great understanding of how much will be fixed in the future. CDPR concentrated most of their efforts in 2021 tackling performance and bugs, and now many are hopeful that numerous quality of life improvements are coming, but if the police system fix is anything to go by, I have concerns. Anyway, one feature that is strangely absent in the game is vehicle chases, and in a live stream from last month, the game's quest director was asked why a feature as basic as car chases, something in almost all open world games, is not here, and the quest director had a very mind-boggling response. First of all, not every open world game, right? Because like, I, I don't think that Sonic did chase uh, game will have it or the Elden Ring uh, open world game will have it like I think you're just basically uh, I understand your point absolutely but let's be realistic right like the open world games uh, that you're referring to is most likely GTA right like I'm not sure what else um, uh, that you can be referring to I guess the um, uh, oh, uh, sorry, the game from Maybe Ubisoft. Watchdog? Yes, exactly. Yeah, Watch the Watchdogs uh, is another one, right? Like, it's not all open world games. That's one thing. Second thing is, uh, the, the the thing is that, uh, and I've been talking about it uh, multiple times in the in the in the past, you know, in the streams, that it's been many times. Uh, uh, it's been mainly here in our case because of various limitations, you know, uh, that we had. And in this specific case, it was just a technical limitation. 
And uh, yeah, that was a somewhat hostile response that many did not like to hear. As I'm sure everyone knows, car chases is not this rare mechanic only in GTA and Watch Dogs. Really, any game with cars has this. Now, with comparing to Elden Ring and Sonic, that's just ridiculous. It's an answer that feels like it's in bad faith. And actually, how he ended his response is all he should have said. Technical limitations. Limitations that exist because of CDPR's questionable decision-making during the development of this game, in which many of the people that would be needed for a mechanic like this left after The Witcher 3. Then on top of that, it was a revolving door with those in charge of building the game's engine and AI. CDPR had to rely on a lot of people with inexperience with multiple departments, especially on the technical side, lacking veteran staff. This was something I investigated a while ago and further confirmed by conversations that I've had with multiple CDPR devs over the past year. So while I am hopeful Cyberpunk 2077 turns it around this year, it's honestly ridiculous to imply that open world car chases are a rare feature, because they're not. And for a company that advertised their title as the next generation of gaming prior to release, it's reasonable to believe something that was in the early 2000s GTA games would be here. Anyway, a lot is happening in gaming to start off 2022. The Microsoft Activision Blizzard deal is obviously the big story that everyone is talking about, and even now it's difficult to grapple with the fact that Microsoft now owns Doom, Halo, Fallout, Minecraft, Guitar Hero, Diablo, Overwatch, Warcraft, Call of Duty, Starcraft, Gears, Spyro, Crash Bandicoot, Wolfenstein, Fable, Forza, Candy Crush, Dishonored, Quake, The Elder Scrolls, and so much more. I'm still trying to process how I feel about this, but ultimately one thing is for sure. I'm much more happy that Kodak and his team will no longer lead over Call of Duty and the many other franchises they have. For the last few years, almost everything under Activision has been degrading and falling apart, with so many running for the doors. This will hopefully do wonders for the development teams and allow them better work environments to create. And you hear me saying a lot of hopefully this and that. And I say that because there is questions about how Microsoft and Phil Spencer will manage over all of this successfully. There's also the question of how Call of Duty will be handled. Could it stop at the yearly releases and give the dev teams more time? And how much exclusivity will come into play? Spencer has indicated that they are committed with keeping COD on PlayStation, but he did give a vague enough answer in which a few years from now, Call of Duty could be only available on Xbox and PC, with maybe, say, Warzone remaining multi-platform. Do I think that'll happen? Probably not, but they did spend 70 billion dollars, and for what it's worth, without a doubt, I do think all of Blizzard's games will eventually go exclusive. The question is just with Call of Duty, and I suppose what Sony does about all of this, which maybe come to some sort of deal with Microsoft. I'm certain Phil Spencer would love to get Xbox Game Pass in some capacity on PlayStation, and maybe this accomplishes that. Regardless, this is happening, and now we all wait to see how the rest of this industry reacts. But yeah, 2022 is certainly starting off with some fire. And as always, I want to know your thoughts down in the comment section below below about all of this, but thank you for watching. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this video or if you found any informative value, and make sure to follow my other social media accounts for updates on new videos. Links are always down in the description below. I'm most active on Twitter, giving opinions on news that I do not always get in a video form, so do make sure to follow me over there. Also check out my Discord for all sorts of discussion on games, and again, thank you for joining. Consider subscribing for more videos like this, and I'll see you later.